Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to our series, The Future Mind. Today, we have with us guest Patrick Harper, a selling author of Daimonic Reality and the Philosopher's Secret Fire. He will be in conversation today with Alex Gomez de Marin, director of the Pari Center and curator of this series. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Alex. Welcome. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, everyone, um, for coming again to this monthly series. Wow, I have lots of questions for Patrick. It, it's really fantastic to have you here. Thanks for making the effort, for doing it live. And, and... You're welcome. Well, let me phrase how you have helped me, I believe, you've helped me go, go one step further because as a scientist, I realized long ago that reductionism doesn't quite work despite its success. Then there was another, uh, another ism, mechanicism, this mechanical view of nature, it's not quite it. Then there's this third ism. I call this the unholy trinity. It's materialism. And, and we could discuss, and we do discuss, all hours and hours about how materialism is wrong and so on. But then, as if it were, on another level, there's dogmatism and there's skepticism. But there was an other ism that I, I was totally blind to. And this is what your books are helping me see, which is literalism. So I wanted to start by asking you, well, what's wrong with literalism and why have we bought into this distinction between fact and fiction that your books kind of merge and elevate into a third realm, which is the realm of imagination? Yes, well, I'm I'm inclined to see. I hadn't really considered literalism too deeply, and until it became borne in upon me that it might be the single greatest folly of of modernity. That um, that you know, with the with the Enlightenment, you know, we began to um, over praise rationalism and so on, and there was a whole movement to cast out the products of the imagination as being just you know the province of of uh you know children or women or you know that that there was no hard facts you know that, that they were just fictions fairy tales stories you know and this began much earlier it began in the 17th century with with um with people like thomas hobbes who were in his great masterpiece leviathan you know, just slams his fist on the table repeatedly saying we can have no more of of these these tales that nursemaids corrupt our children with and so on you know and um we began to you know espouse a worldview which didn't didn't admit of of any truth that wasn't a literal truth um for example you know you could easily do away with the garden of eden because it was not literally true you know um but the metaphorical resonances of 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 an image like the garden of eden which tells us so much about the human condition even the origin of consciousness you know things like that um you know that sort of thing was completely disregarded and so all, all the great true stories of humanity which are which are the myths you know i think the myths are as it were the true stories of the soul were um disregarded as as mere fancy and uh, as as being just untrue uh, because they weren't literally true but in the uh, wise words of sadist he said uh, of the myths he said these things never happened they are always a nice switch of tenses there to indicate the the, the fundamental importance of of myth and the mythopoetic imagination uh, which i espouse and and so more and more i see you know literalism as a kind of deadening um, you know a sort of deadening effect on modern consciousness you know 
I mean, I make no bones about it in my books. I think that the, the you know the ground of being is is imagination. Um, I didn't make that up. It's a long tradition that comes from Plato and extends through you know. Well, I won't I won't name the people who have espoused this view, but um, it goes all the way up from the Neoplatonists to to the Renaissance magicians and thinkers to the Romantic philosophers and poets and in the modern age perhaps only you know a few people um it's it's hard to Jung began to began to come round to the idea that imagination was fundamental but his chief disciple James Hillman who I think is easily the best of the post Jungians he was completely unequivocal about it he thought imagination was the ground of reality itself that everything is image and he was very influenced by Henri Corbin um, great French scholar of of um, medieval Sufi mysticism um, and you know I, I I haven't read that much Corbin I find him very difficult but fortunately there's a there's an American chap called Tom Cheatham who who has has made a deep study of Corbin and has written sort of guides to Corbin for dummies like me so but you know Hillman and Corbin are the exception rather than the rule but I, f I find them very exalted company and I'd be glad to be numbered amongst them we'll be coming back to this because what happens when I when I read your books is that for one moment I think I get it but then of course I revert to my usual training and patterns of thought and it's like well but it actually happened or it didn't. So I go back to this idol of facts um, versus fiction. So I suppose it's it's really hard for our Western mind to unlearn that. And at the same time, and here's another beautiful contradiction, what your books show, I believe, is also that this is a properly Western tradition, the, the, the golden chain. It's always been with us and that's so interesting right because it, it's not it's not what science did to reality or it's not what christianity did to reality or it's not like we want to borrow some new age or even eastern thinking you're saying well this is this is part of our in this case the west indigenous tradition yes yes that was that was an exciting discovery for me because you know when i was looking for some kind of um, philosophy of life which I intuited to be true you know I, I I couldn't really find it at first and I was very attracted to you know oriental philosophies and so on because they seem to me to provide so many answers but of course the cultural difference is so great not to mention the language um, that I was a bit dismayed you know I thought it would take a lifetime to to learn the requisite Sanskrit and 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 give due uh, due importance to Buddhism and to Hinduism maybe uh, but so I but luckily through really through reading Jung and through being put in touch with what the alchemists called the golden chain you know this tradition the the imaginative tradition which is which is passed up from hand to hand as it were um, I discovered that that kind of tradition um, within our own within my own culture and it was like it's largely been called um occult you know which just means hidden you know and it's certainly been neglected um if not outright ignored especially by uh our modern worldview but um it, it's all there if you dig for it and there are indeed times in history in western history in which it has briefly sort of um emerged from the shadows and flourished you know for example in alexandria in the second and third centuries AD um that was a fantastic it was a Hellenistic a Greek-speaking culture which had you know which fostered so many different sects and cults all of which were vying for supremacy you know and uh, you know amongst the Gnostics and the Stoics and and the Neoplatonists and imagination played played a large part you know Plotinus is writes very eloquently about the imaginative life 
And so, and then it went underground as, as Greek learning was lost and, you know, Christianity suppressed all these alternative imaginative visions of the cosmos, declared them heresies. Um, you know, they, they founded and, and were lost, but were rediscovered, as you know, at the Renaissance, when the, you know, via the Arabs, the old Neoplatonic and, and did he play to himself, those texts became available again. And that they were immediately seized upon it. And and Marsilio Ficino, who was a, who sort of headed up the um, imaginative Renaissance. I mean, he thought that imagination was the, the was the ground of reality. And so, and after him, Jacob Burma took it up, took up the took up the uh, torch at the beginning of the seventeenth century. And then the great Romantic revival once again, um, you know, rehabilitated imagination is the most important faculty you know the incisive faculty of the soul um and um then it was pushed down again by materialism uh, and so on and and i'm hoping for another big revival in the, the the 20th century saw a few notable notable exponents of the imaginative the importance of imagination like for instance jung but mostly amongst the poets um, you know, my my earliest training was was in poetry and drama, so I was very conscious from an early age of how imagination was carried forth by you know not just Shakespeare, who was actually a key figure, but in the twentieth century by T. S. Eliot and W. B. Yeats, and latterly by the British poet laureate Ted Hughes, who was a great exponent of of the primacy of of imagination. So that's roughly the sort of tradition. And I'm hoping, of course, for another great surging up of imagination as as the, the, the primary faculty of the soul, you know. How do that's we it think... in a nutshell. That's the, that's the golden chain in a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> Not bad to describe <laughs> it in a few minutes. I will come back and I come back. So how do we think about facts then? Do we think about facts as fictions? Are facts fictions of the imagination? Uh, well, don't ask me. I mean, because, you know, I'm a Western man and I'm, I'm, you know, my whole opus is, a, is an attempt to deliteralize myself, you know, mm. and I haven't done it, you know. Um, but it's, like, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard to say. It's very hard to, to point to the the primary truth of the metaphorical view of, of the universe, you know. Um, I always point to William Blake. You know, he was he was a great, he, he thought that imagination was the most important thing. And he talks of, of two ways of looking at the world, really. And he, and he thought the idea was to cu cultivate double vision that you that you see literally but you see metaphorically at the same time and he talks about seeing with the eye which is single vision he calls it you know and then he talks about seeing through the eye which is this double vision so for instance he says you know something like um what's his poem uh he talks about um across the road um I see an old man grey, but something, something, it's a thistle across the way. In other words, to single vision, we see merely a thistle. But with double vision, we see the image of an old man within the thistle. And this is something that we all do all the time. We see images within the natural world. So within the facts, there is always a, another meaning buried, you know, which is not immediately apparent. And we have to develop that faculty of double vision, which is what imagination is. It's like Leonardo da Vinci is in his notebooks. He describes as he lying in bed, looking at these stains on his ceiling. And he sees battles taking place and processions and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, now, you can say that that's just simply false. But, you know, my whole point is, is that I think the the. the the double vision version of things that seeing through the eye is more real than the single vision. You know, Blake talks very scathingly of 
of you know the single vision of Locke and Hume and Newton's sleep. You know, he thinks Newton was sort of half blind. And, and I would and I, and I would extend that. You know, I mean, I I think that the whole cosmos is a. I mean, scientists like you think take at face value scientific discoveries about the universe. You know, you think that that you think that that is the true a true the true picture of the cosmos. Um, other cultures, Amazonian tribesmen or Australian Aboriginals, or have a completely different view of the cosmos. And I think theirs is as true as ours is. That I think that our universe, we've turned the, the wonderful harmonies and, and translucent spheres and music of the Greek cosmos into this rather awful universe. And what we learn from that is, is the, the, the way in which we investigate things determines what we find. You know that the scientific method itself um, reveals has constructed a universe um, which we think is the case, but I don't think it's the case at all. I much prefer the medieval vision of the universe, you know, and I think I'm entitled to um, to believe in that if you see what I mean. Um, but it's ex almost impossible for us not to believe that our modern worldview has superseded all other worldviews, which we regard as childish and primitive, and all other view, worldviews in the past. Um, but I think our, our, our view of the universe is, is incomparably impoverished compared to, for, for example, Plato's cosmogony. So that's what I'd say. But it's, it's almost impossible for us to understand that, you know. What are facts? They're the result of quantifying measurement. And you know, if you don't believe things that anything that it can't be quantified or measured, well, I don't know where to begin to to say how impoverished your life must be. You know, but in fact, we all know that the the quantifying and measurement and numbers are the least important thing about our lives. You know, the moment you buy a dog and you're completely infatuated with it, you know perfectly well that the, the, the essence of life is very far from being quantifiable or measure, measurable, measurable. Do you see what I mean, Alex? It's, yes. It's very hard to make a case because, you know, our world, our literalistic worldview is so overpowering, you know, and it's so, and it really works, you know, it's, it's superb, you know, but we have to look at what, what we've lost. You know that we've lost that that double vision, that ability to see through. You know, every psychotherapist knows that. You know, when a person presents themselves as a presents their life, which becomes their case history, their job is to see through that, to see through the facts, to the metaphors, to the deeper meanings behind those that bare curriculum vitae, which the patient presents to the psychotherapist in other words we need a, a, a poetic perception of the world in which we see the metaphors either behind or through or as well as the literal i'm i've been trying to relocate what science is for me because i just happen to be a scientist and i started all these series of conversations first calling them the future scientist and then the future human and so on but the quest was really well, there seems to be something missing and something misplaced about science as we speak of it or as we practice it. And, and that's why discovering that I was a total devotee of literalism, despite my my quarrels about materialism, is is has shaken, has shaken some of the foundations, not all of them. And so I'm still trying to see what's what's the role of, of science today, perhaps in understanding, and now we can introduce your terms here, or these models to understand this, this imagination as ground of being, the role of science to understand daimonic reality. So tell, tell us about daimonic reality and, and we'll dive into the demons and, and or daemons. I mean, they, they, it needs to be pronounced well because otherwise people say we're talking about the devil. No, 
So this opens, and by the way, as your books do, and I was showing you before, I have the Spanish, the Spanish translations by Atalanta, which are amazing. Um, I'm missing Mercurius, that's with a friend of mine. But each of these books of yours is, as I see, an effort to just re-express that, but, but through very original and important windows, like the window of the soul, or in this case, daimonic reality. So, so what's the daimonic reality? What are these daimons? Why are so important? Why are they so important in this in this understanding? Well, why are they so important? When C.S. Lewis, the great medieval scholar, wrote a, an account of the uh, medieval cosmos he came to a chapter in which he said there's one feature of this medieval cosmos which is perfectly harmonious and beautifully formed you know it's like a great cathedral a great structure very very beautiful but he said the one thing that doesn't quite fit in is what he called the long ivy the long-lived ones and he's and his chapter says you know frankly there's evidence that everybody in medieval times believed in things like elves, fairies, hobbits, bogs, scrikes, Pharisees, um, derricks, a, a vast list of, of supernatural creatures which did not fit into his scheme at all. And his chapter is very scanty. I mean, he says, I don't know what to make of these things. And then he falls back on an anecdote that that his anecdotes that his that his maid in Ireland used to tell him about the fairies and things like that, and he said, "I I sort of believe these are true stories in some sense. They represent some reality, but I don't know where to put them." And that problem has remained ever since. That people continue to see unfailingly, and there's a vast literature which documents this, as not to mention the internet. Um, nobody knows what to do with these things. And, and C.S. Lewis concludes, he thinks, he says, I think their importance is their unimportance. <laughs> that they, they are sort of, they range from the sublime to the ridiculous, but they're often absurd. Yeah. And I was, I, I hadn't read C.S. Lewis at that point, but when I was trying to form my own worldview, you know, both scientific and theological and psychological and so on, I too thought, well, I can't leave out these strange creatures which have persisted in, not just in our culture, but in every culture. There's no culture which doesn't recognise some creatures analogous to the Irish fairies, which is the, the kinds of creatures I'm an expert in, being Irish, and members of my family have seen them. So, you know, I have no reason to doubt they represent a reality of some kind. But what kind of a reality? So I dug into this and I decided to call these these creatures after the Greek daimones, daimones. Um, but they refer to, I mean, there's no culture which doesn't have them. Um, Quaishins in China, um, jinns in Arabia, elves in Europe, um, Yunwat Sunsi amongst the Cherokees. Um, oh, and if they're not creatures in their own right, they... Their ancestors, you know, the ancestors play the part of the, of the diamonds. And if the ancestors don't, animals do, especially in, amongst animist tribes. So there are sort of three categories, but they all share the same attributes and so on. And I, I was able, after extensive reading in, in folklore and myth and in anthropology, to isolate certain characteristics. And... Um, these creatures are, can never be brought into the mainstream. That's the interesting thing about them. C.S. Lewis was baffled by them, as science is baffled by them. You have no choice but to either deny they exist at all, that they're just hallucinations, delusions, you know, um, or else products of, of the, uh, or else imaginary, as if we were, which is quite different from an imaginative, you know, that they are sort of fantasy creatures that belong in children's fairy tales. And yet reports of these creatures persist. And um, and new ones, and they change shape. That, that One of their, their chief character, characteristics are they're very elusive. They're always marginal. They actually appear, tend to appear at marginal places. 
They like seashores, bridges, crossroads, you know, transitional places, uh, liminal zones, as as the anthropologists might say, from limen, a threshold, threshold zone. Um, that they are always, uh, that they shape change, they shape shift. The fairies can appear as a gust of wind or a ball of wool, or they can appear as an animal. You know, the, the Irish can look at a look at a flock of sheep and say that that sheep there is not right. They can see the sheep that is not not actually a sheep. It's a fairy. Um, they're always ambiguous, always contradictory. Uh, the worst of their, I mean, they they are both malevolent and benign. For instance, you see, Christianity took up the they Christianity could not ignore the daimons, but it polarized them. That's another effect of literalism, by the way. It polarizes ambiguity into black and white. It polarized them into angels and devils, um, which were also in believed in literally, interestingly. Um, but the diamonds themselves themselves are always contradictory. And the worst of their contradictions, from our point of view, is that they can be both material and immaterial. Um, anybody who's met a fairy is or indeed for example an alien from a ufo um, is in no doubt about their solid material existence but then they can vanish or vaporize or, or disappear just like that you know uh it so it present they present a real problem to us you know and um what else do they what else do they represent oh yes the other function that they have is they mediate that they are mediators between this world and what the folklorists call the other world which can be characterized in many different ways uh, for, for example i think the imagination itself is an autonomous realm analogous to the other world um socrates talks about the daimons he says that the daimons convey the wishes of men to the gods and the will of gods to men. Um, and without the daimons, there is no intercourse between men and the gods. So they, they, they fulfill this particularly interesting mediatory role. And, and Socrates, of course, was an expert on daimons since he had a personal daimon who always told him when he was doing something displeasing to the gods. But the personal daimon is a Oh, that's another long story. Um, we'll come back to this. I want to ask you yes, about your can, personal we'll, diamond we'll come back later. To yes, we we'll come back to that. So that those are the outstanding characteristics of of the diamonds. You know, they are elusive, marginal, shape shifting, um, contradictory and ambiguous, and mediatory. And that seems to me to um, that seems to be just something very fundamental about the nature of of the world of reality you know that we we if we leave out the diamonds you see if you know as i think who was it said he who denies the diamonds breaks the chain that that connects men to the gods you know that they, they play this in very very important role and so if we ignore them we ignore them at our peril but um the trouble is you know they can be they could be sublime and angelic and bring us wisdom and knowledge, you know, as people attest to in, in, in great visionary experiences. But they're also absurd, ludicrous, you know. Then, you know, they're sublime and ridiculous, you know, they're the little annoying fairies, you know, in in Cornwall the pixies, Cornish pixies can lead you astray. Well, they all lead you astray, actually. It's another daimonic feature. You know, they they can make you lost. They can make you, they can cast a glamour on the world so that you see the world differently. You know, the the epistemology of the, of the diamonds is a very interesting one, you know. Um, and so I thought, well, I must, you know, I have to take these into account somehow. And so I, you know, I wrote a, I decided to write a few pages and it turned into a whole book about them, you know, as daimonic reality. But essentially, it's the same as it's the same as Jung's what Jung called psychic reality. You know, he thought that you know psychic reality was this realm of image. In other words, that it was imagination itself. Um, 
out of which the literal world was distilled on the one hand and on the other hand you know the the deeper the deeper the, the spiritual world was distilled in another way so it kind of underlay both the distinction between spirit and matter that that the, the psychic reality had a spiritual aspect and a material aspect but it underlay them both it was merely it merely embodied the contradictions between spirit and matter which it had no trouble doing because it psychic reality is daimonic in that way it is contradictory um i've explained that very badly alex because it's so, I, well it's, i it's disagree i disagree i well, disagree okay, well, well plus you combine this with with stories of course and 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 in a way you're telling all these fairy tales which has this connotation right nowadays but you're telling them in a way you've never read them and as you know I am at, I'm attempting to investigate these anomalous phenomena through science. And I thought I was kind of at the edge looking at this, but the, the amount of creatures, entities, and if I, if I may put it bluntly, crazy shit that you're able to just describe and then give a sense of continuity and unity, but at the same time, never pinning it down. It's both fascinating and, and annoying again, because all these features you've just, I think very, very clearly um, unfolded here are precisely what, what scientific literalism despises, right? Like absurdity, yeah. contradiction, and specifically one of them, I wanted to ask you about this one in particular, them being tricksters, like trying to trick us. I mean, are they helping us or not? And if, if why would they want to trick us? Um, yes, well, the idea of, of tricksters is extremely alien to, you know, uh, to, to modern Western thought and indeed to Christian thought, except that the devil is a tr trickster. The devil it deceives you. Um, but to, to other cultures, well, when you consider the, the 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 North American native mythologies, they all have their trickster gods, Hare and Raven, and Trickster himself was the was the I forget what tribe calls their god Trickster, but um, and they're seen as you know absolutely key figures in, in the culture of these people because they are the also the culture heroes. In other words, they bring the arts and the and the um, technology to humans. You know, they bring them fire and they bring them the arts of cooking and hunting and so on. So they're, they're key figures. But at the same time, they're always getting into terrible, you know, they behave in a, in a ludicrous way, you know, and they make elementary mistakes and, and so on. And it, and it seems to me this points to a, to a real, um, a, a really important principle that we have not just neglected, but we just don't understand at all. Um, and I think that the diamonds that appear in our culture are trying to re remind us of, of this aspect of what I shall boldly call reality, uh, uh, that we, we've ignored, that all the diamonds are, in a sense, in the pay of Hermes, you know, who was the great trickster god of the Greeks and of Mercury, the trickster god amongst the Romans. Um, and I think they point to to something that we've we've neglected, and that's why we just deny the diamonds. But if they have, if the diamonds have any purpose at all, and it's hard to discern at times, it is to subvert the very culture that excludes them, and so on. And the more we deny them, I mean, Freud's great axiom was, you know, whatever is is repressed returns in another guise. And that is a kind of charter for shape changing, you know, that the diamonds don't don't just change shape in themselves, as it were, but they change shape across time and, and across cultures. So, for example, you know, the, the fairies that lived underground, when they were banished, you know, they return from on high as UFOs and aliens, you know, that, that I see a continuity between in, in the daimonic tradition. So wherever we, whichever place we we banish them from, they return unexpectedly in in another way. 
you know it's why I, in daimonic reality i point to the way that <clears throat> for example at the height of materialism in the victorian age there was a sudden kind of influx of spiritualism you know and and everybody i mean the the intelligentsia attended seances and were astounded by the by the the, the tricks of the spirits you know that they they could they turned tables and they sent a ports flying through walls you know and and scientists investigated them like mad you know and um well the conclusions that scientists came to was just a reflection of that science that science particular scientists prejudices really so william crooks who was commissioned to debunk them studied it as fairly and as rigorously as he could and, and said you know i'm afraid it's all true <laughs> and the royal society said well it, 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 it's not possible he said i didn't say it was possible i said it was true mm. so um you know so, so there we, there we have it and 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 i see the diamonds i i definitely see the the diamonds at work in the in the marvelous quantum world you know that everything you can say about a fairies can equally be said about subatomic particles you know <laughs> that they are elusive marginal very hard to pin down principle of uncertainty um non-locality acting on each other at a distance and so forth and so forth you know that, that to me they're just literalized literalized diamond you know and indeed you know the, the closer we get to them the faster they recede you know that we can never quite get a grip on them and we end up with absurd notions like virtual particles which appear out of nothing and then disappear again before we can grab them you know and we, and we can't observe them we can observe their traces or their effects yes. you know and that is that that it just makes me laugh you know it's it's a pure description of of daimonic reality but translated into the rather questionable language of of scientism you know you dedicate a few not many pages explicitly to science and technology but they they always make me smile because because i can see it's like it's like if the demons were or the diamonds were riding with you and and in a way you're you seem to be pissing everyone off but but at the same time everybody should be with you let me say let me say why for instance in the case of uaps or ufos well some people really want to believe or they're really convinced that these are physical spacecraft landing right i mean i don't know yeah. others would just christianize them and then demonize them or make make them angels for instance um others would literally just deny them altogether and you're saying no to each of those options and then again there's this third realm that you're pointing to but it's so hard to just hold on it because quite quickly there are all these factions who would just do something on on this daimonic reality that turns it into something else and so you need to insist again uh, let me also apropos of this say What's been the reception? I mean, Daimonic Reality in particular was, was written long ago, but in a way you were a, a pioneer of, of this movement today of, of really entertaining anomalous phenomena seriously. And by seriously, we could say scientifically, and then you would say literally, but you, you were far, far ahead in, in just seeing all of that and articulating it. How were you received and how are you considered today amongst those communities? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I get a few emails from people who say, "Oh, this is this has solved a lot of problems for me," you know. But it's quite it's quite a subtle way of regarding of these things that because we are we are hardened literalists, we have to say no. UFOs don't exist. You know, the the, the scientists just can't look at them. It's like I think I say in my introduction that it, it's a bit like people who are trained in classical music and just can't listen to pop music, you know, it, that they're trained in such a way that they cannot look at these things at all. So they just say it's nonsense, you know, but they haven't done it. I mean, they, it's completely unscientific often to say that because they've done absolutely no research at all. They just can't 
bear it. You know, they just can't face these anomalous creatures, the, these UFOs, and and indeed the the, uh, the, the strange fairy like creatures that roam the world, like Bigfoot or or lake monsters or things like that. You know. Um, what if what if they say they come from higher dimensions? How do you feel about that? Well, yeah, well, what are what are these higher dimensions? You know, I mean, you're just removing the problem to another to another to a you know one one of the favorite explanations of ufos that they come from you know parallel dimensions or something like that and that gives it a kind of spurious scientific gloss yes. because... that's part of strategy to make them respectable there's that's part yes. of a strategy but but also it's meant in that technical sense too is it well it could yeah you can try to fit it into abstractions right Whatever. yes 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 well it it, it just doesn't um it just removes the problem to another dimension, if you see what I mean. Um, <laughs> that, that parallel universes are the, are themselves problematic. You know, you know, I think there are other worlds, yes, but I think they're all in this one. You see, the the other world is not a a literal place. You see, science postulates multiverses, you know, and things like that. But it's only because this universe isn't enough, so they have to postulate a whole lot more. But I I think that's just madness you know i think the scientists are crazy you know there aren't there aren't you know you, the universes aren't created alternative universes are not created every single moment you know as as they would have us believe or some some scientists would have us believe you know i i think that you know that it's more a question of of um perspective and depth that that all everything is already with us you know, I take the Blakeian view that the earthly paradise, heaven itself, is already here if we could but perceive it. You know, it's a question of, of you know, transcending the senses, you know, opening the doors of perception and seeing the world as it is, infinite. Um, and yes, and so, uh, and so if, if scientists don't, just ignore things like ufos or uaps if you prefer that they're just invented reinventing the wheel you know i've i've been here before so many times i'm not even following the latest developments you know but now that you know the us navy has established that they are actual things you know uh, and they're spending millions of pounds um you know pursuing the literalistic quest for actual out of this world spacecraft or else you know technological advances that have been made by other nations or something like that you know none of this is going none of this is going to work i think i could probably save them millions if they just read my book you know but that of course will never happen because i'm a i'm a crackpot and a nutter you know and yeah. no one no one in the mainstream will ever read my book because it's a daimonic book yeah yeah it'll, it'll i can never, see that and it'll never be mainstream because the diamonds are never mainstream. Yeah. Mm. Now let's talk about this from the side of the experientiers. And let me let me ask you the following question. But before that, I think another insight I got from reading you and talking to you is that we have so much trouble with these realities because we can experience them, we can relate to them, but we cannot think them. And since we're used to conceptualizing things, kind of apprehending them with our with, with logos rather than mythos, right? Then th there's this, it's very uncomfortable. It's like, I, I can feel it, I can experience it, and I cannot think it. And and precisely this month, at the end of the month, we have Jeff Kripal, it's coming to the Paris Center, and he's going to to give us this extended weekend um, residency on, on how to think impossibly. And so I was talking to him the other day, and, and we were talking about your work, and I said, well, I'm talking to Patrick very soon. Would you like to ask him a question? And then he posed the following one. Well, I have it written somewhere, but but his point was not so much when it comes to those who investigate those phenomena, but those who experience them. Like, yeah. to, what does your work, how does your work help, or maybe it doesn't, or it doesn't need to, help to those who experience those really 
anomalous phenomena and that they feel that there was something very physical in the room. Does, does, does demonic reality help in any way? Is it enough for them to know, well, sure, there's the realm of the imagination, but that felt very concrete. What would you tell them? Um, well, I would say that, that, that it is concrete, but concrete isn't the same as literal. Yeah, very physical. Can, can I say? Can I say there was this mechanical bug on my chest at two a.m. It wasn't just something I was Im you see imagining. I was going to say, <laughs> well, but exactly. you, you see what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know, but you see what I mean? Like that thing was mechanical, was metallic as this thing, as this very thing. Was it? What, what well, you, I, don't, I don't know what you're referring to. Actually. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm making up a, a possible case in which a person just has an encounter with something that's equally physical as what we would consider physical reality. And the question is, how does your understanding of demonic reality help the experiencers in that case? Well, I think I've, I think I've already I indicated that the most worrying contradiction about the demonic is that it can manifest wholly materially that you know that irish folklore is full of fairies who don't just appear as ethereally as if they were ghosts no they can run at you and and they can strike you hence the word stroke you know the words the fairies give you a stroke and that word that is still the word we use when someone has a stroke you know it was used to be attributed to fairy action and you were left numbed and senseless and deranged you know you know they, they are really dangerous and anybody who and, and people have had alien encounters in which they've been zapped by ray guns and phys the physical effects have been documented you know they go to hospital and they uh, and they're you know disoriented dizzy vomiting you know as if they've been exposed to radio radioactivity but this is just you know another retelling of the old of the old folklore about the fairy stroke or or they give you a touch and when we say someone's touched in the head they mean that used to mean touched by the fairies you know or the elves who they're dangerous so it's it's simply a contradiction that we have to accept you know that they can be material but not necessarily literal that the imagination jung himself said you know that in that he came to a, an advanced view of imagination through reading alchemical texts and they talk about imagination as a subtle body in other words they recognize that imagination is not something immaterial it it, it has a kind of material component to it so it can be real but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know it is it is only material or literally material you know it's a paradox you see and, and a paradox is by definition something we can't think you know we can't think it we have to you know we have to we have to form some other faculty of of grasping it now what is the greatest paradox in in our history well it's the idea that that god who is lord, the god almighty who is lord of the universe can become a man i mean the greeks the romans thought this was just ludicrous they were quite happy with the idea of gods but the idea that a god could become a man impossible the jews have thought thought it was just blasphemous you know but christians said no we're going we're running with this and we're we're going to relate to it in a new way and that new way is faith and faith is a complicated way of relating to a paradox and it includes things like doubt but so it's very hard to define what faith is but it's a way of admitting to the reality of paradox and of grasping it, it, it and it and it and it's absolutely a key feature of of, of imagination and of the daimonic that Everything is paradoxical in that realm, but paradoxes may well be, you know, a, a key feature of what we laughingly call reality. And but science hates paradoxes, and yet 
at, at the extremes of the, of the scientific inquiry, it is itself confronted with with paradoxes all the time. So, um, but the imagination can embrace paradox in a way that just th logical thinking can't. You know, a thing cannot be A and not A, says logic. But the daimonic realm says, oh yes, a thing can be both A and not A very easily. You know. Yes. That's, yes. A, that's the best the I can do because, uh, yeah, you know, I can't really ex explain it better better than that. You know. Yeah, the excluded middle, and yet it's it's irresistible temptation to me when you say that they can be physically blasted to, to say, well, what are the laws of physics then at that moment, right? Despite the paradox, what is going on? Is energy conserved? Like, it's like, well, we we must know that, <laughs> and you're saying, yeah. well, good luck. Good luck with your game, but it's <laughs> <laughs> that's on the one side, on the scientific side. But I want to come back to the experience again and again ask you maybe a prescription. And, and I mean the following. Some of these things sometimes happen, happen to us, right? We can have an apparition, we can have a new death experience, we can have whatever. Sometimes they happen maybe more often, but I would say, at least in my experience, I don't feel like in, I inhabit the daimonic reality in my everyday. So would you prescribe, recommend kind of working towards experiencing that more frequently, even being able to just go into these other worlds here now, back and forth at will, or is the nature of this reality just to manifest occasionally whenever they decide? Yes, I, I see what you mean. Um, well, I, I, I sometimes wonder why I haven't had any daimonic experiences. And I think it may well be that I've already accommodated them through, through my imaginative life. That in, there's some sense in which um, actual, sudden, um, often disturbing intrusions of visionary or apparitional beings, daimons, um, is, is, is a way of initiating the obdurate literalism of our consciousness into another way of being. You know, that, that it's quite often hard-headed rationalists who are abducted by aliens, you know, and uh, naturally they try and explain it explain it in terms of their rationalism but they're missing an opportunity to be initiated and transformed into a much wider perception of of reality which includes anomalies which includes paradoxes and contradictions and so on um so i think i would say that sorry what was your question no i think you're answering it exactly like well um, the question was whether we should try to dive deeper and more often into those realities but you answer it the other way around and i think i remember reading in your book when you say well these things probably happen to those people who don't naturally swim in, in the imaginative realm and so they need they need these kinks from time to time right yes i mean i think that's possible but then of course you know visions and apparitions do also happen to people who who understand themselves as being in the common parlance psychic in some way you know that they they have already they've already grown up with um intuitions or you know spiritualist type um contact with with spirits but they themselves are literalists you know they take spirits literally in the way that materialists take matter literally um that the, the diamonds won't have either you know it wants to bring it always wants to bring things together in into a into a whole that is unfortunately contradictory yeah and so, yeah. And, and so yeah and so i i so i don't quite know what what to say about that i mean i think generally speaking i mean the trick is is to just take a more imaginative view of the world which is to say a sort of poetic view of the world and to try and develop that mm. double vision yes, that they yes. talked about in which we see another story behind yes the surface behind the facts there's behind facts there's always another story yeah because the grumpy the, the grumpy literal way of asking for that there was just i was just thinking about it, it will be come on patrick go and show me a fairy 
mean, show it to me. I, I'll believe it. But it's that's not that's not that's not the game plan. Yes, unfortunately, I can't. But but <laughs> but I but um, you see, I mean the the way in which we attend to the to the world i mean what what are we doing when we're painting a tree well you know the the art the act of artistic activity is is extremely complicated that we're not just reproducing a tree plato condemned art on those grounds that you know that art was just a copy of something that was already a copy of something in the divine intelligible world of the forms and so on but Plotinus said no that's not what art is doing it's returning to the form of the tree and it's representing the the true form of the tree through the actual material tree and so a, a tree a good painting as we say a, a real art a, a, a good painting of a tree will be more tree-like than, than a tree itself. But that depends on the perception of the artist. It's as if he's seeing the soul of the tree, the dryad within the tree, but he's seeing both at the same time. He sees the, the form of the tree embodied by a particular tree. And, and art, art is, is in, in other words, a kind of daimonic activity, that that's what imagination means that we see through the tree to the form of the tree and we try and marry the two so that it's not a general abstract thing and it's not only a sort of photographic image it's a living embodiment of 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 a of the essence of a tree uh, in other words it's a presence it is itself a daimon you know and that's what symbols are a symbol is Anything can be a symbol. Poets can make anything symbolic. But suddenly we see a, 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 you know, a poem about you know, a mouse or a hedgehog or, a, or, or the moon or something like that. Through the beautiful manipulation of language, it suddenly becomes a symbol of all sorts of other things with range and depth that we had not suspected before. Um, I'm explaining this very badly because it's so... So hard to pin down, you know, because it is all a question of, it is a question of how we perceive things. But my contention is that there's no such thing as just sort of perception. Perception is always underpinned by imagination. And so that, you know, that we see the world that we expect or we get the world we deserve, you know. But everything depends on the amount of imaginative attention we infuse into the world. And the people who are the doyens of this are the artists. Something like that. I insist. You're, I think you're doing a great job. At least it's, it's, <laughs> it's helping me again to, to dwell on it. I have a last question and a, a very difficult one. So <laughs> bear with me because I, I want to bring alchemy here. And you've written at least 500 pages on alchemy, right? Or 400 in Mercurius. Um, but maybe the maybe we can say something about it in the following sense. When you describe what alchemy is, and it, it's very difficult, and you say, well, again, don't take it literally. It's not about turning metals into gold, but maybe it's also about that. So that leaves me confused again. But anyways, it has to do with this psychological aspect, and you bring Jung again. And then you say, well, it's about the realization the idea that everything can perfect itself in, in it's natural that thing perfects itself but then what alchemy does maybe one way to explain it but correct me is that it accelerates that process so my last question is is general and difficult it has to do with humanity and evolution and acceleration of whatever needs to be accelerated maybe another way of putting it is is imagination bootstrapping on itself to get somewhere or to evolve into something and is alchemy kind of a major way of achieving that process did that did, does that make any sense yes of course it does um yes well well Jung was quite explicit he just thought that the that the the goal of life is to individuate that is to fulfill all our potential and to turn our our to 
he saw it as as Keith, as the poet Keats said, as the veil of soul making, that we are born with souls, but in some sense they are always immortal and unchanging. But in another sense, we have to make them too. In other words, life is a series of transformation, you know. And that's why rites of passage is so important. Um, that biological change is never enough, you know. That's why puberty rights are universal. Well, not universal, but ne as near as damn it universal. That that if people don't understand the inner meaning of biological change, which is that you have to change from a child to an adult, um, then you never grow up. And, and alchemy is is like um, is like a series of rites of passage. The different stages of alchemy um, are that their aim is to transform the psyche of the practitioner while at the same time never losing contact with the the embodied the material mm. so the processes that the alchemist performs on the substances which are mysterious in themselves he's also performing on himself so this marvelous congruence between outer and inner which is how the analogist worldview operates and, and was operative until at least the well, at least till the time of Newton, say, things like that. So um, the goal of alchemy is is the, the stone, uh, but it's called the stone that is no stone. Uh, it, it's not to make gold, it's to make philosophical gold. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the stone, which is also imaged as, for example, a hermaphrodite, um, you know, it has, it has a lot of symbols all of which you can see are come from the deep unconscious you know strange symbols um the goal is 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 never perhaps finally achieved um that the purpose of life the purpose of the, the, just as jung said that the self which is the his a psychological equivalent of the stone is um is never quite achieved you know, it, it, it's a kind of image that we have in our mind of, of of not perfection, but of wholeness in which every part of ourself is unfolded and individuated to the full and we become um, perfect or whole or superhuman even. Um, and so alchemy is as much is as kind of a way rather than a goal. But in order to pursue the way, you have to have the image of a goal, otherwise you would never embark on it. You must. You have to think it's possible, even if it's not. You could argue that there are some people in this world, perhaps the saints at the end of their lives, or, or some you know, Buddhist mystics, you know, who who achieved that goal. But essentially, for us ordinary people, it's unknowable. You know, nevertheless, we're enjoined to embark on that quest. You know, and to and to try and transform ourselves. And the idea of, you know, na alchemy is described as natura naturans, nature naturing, that it's one sense, it's an entirely natural process, which, you know, which nature is already doing, and we merely speed it up. But it's also called the, the, the opus contra naturam, the work against nature, that the unnatural nature of alchemy, which is highly artificial and specialised, um, activity um is is also true so once again we're left with that paradox that alchemy is 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 both natural and against nature and so on and that's why it's infinitely um uh, well it's so interesting and, and complex and so on and they themselves called it our science but they also called it our philosophy our art they couldn't make up their mind what it was and and that's because it is all these things compacted in in the, in in that process that alchemy is, is a highly sort of compressed version in which you need real scientific expertise with chemical and met metallurgical expertise you need um philosophy you need to you need to draw on other alchemists other philosophies platonism neoplatonism you it's full of myths and stories um and it's also an art. It requires, you know, imaginative engagement with the processes, processes that you're physically enacting. 
uh, and and so it, it is itself a, a soul making the hermetic vessel is an image of the round nature of the soul and the process of reflux distillation is the best image i know of the way in which imagination works because it distills itself out of itself that it's matter and then it's heated and it becomes vapor becomes spirit and then it cools and condenses and returns to the matter again so there's this wonderful circular motion which is a marvelous image of of, of imaginative activity anybody who's written a book or painted a picture knows exactly that that's what happens you take your intransigent materials and you uh, and you you know you imagine and they have to be made volatile and 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 then and then reincorporated and fixed writing a novel is a very circular process as you constantly revise and return and so and so on and so forth um that's what I think about alchemy in the short version. Yes, yes, <laughs> well, fantastic. I will open, I will pass it to Eleanor so that we can open it up for some comments and questions. But just let me say again, um, Patrick, that, that these books, I'm profoundly grateful that you've written them. And I've oh. heard somewhere you saying something like you, you didn't want to, or you had to, but it wasn't like a pleasant choice. You, 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 in a way you were first upon and then they just happened, but I'm, these well, are good. Writing, that's the thing. Yeah. These are good uh, companions and, and guides. So thank you very much for having well, done that. Well, I'm, I'm pleased you got something out of them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Patrick. Now I would like to open it up to all of you. If you do have a question that you would like to ask Alex or Patrick, you can use your raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen that you can find under reactions. Paul, please come in. Thank you very, very much. Uh, synchronistically, your book just appeared. I ordered it even before <laughs> I knew that you were going to be talking here. But, <laughs> and I put it on my bookshelf right next to uh, James Hillman's The Souls Code, who oh, I worked right. with back in the 70s. And I remember working with him. He said, the most important thing is to see through look at the image, but you need to be able to see through. And I really like the way that you, uh, in terms of this, the, the image and how that, that carries you through into the metaphorical, into the mythical yeah. level. I mean, that's, it just really resonates. Back to the uh, question that uh, Alex had asked in terms of experience, I must relate an experience I had in your country, in the UK, in Wiltshire at Stanton St. Bernard's with the crop circle phenomena because it is both either and or. It, it was, I was sleeping, I was staying in a place called the sheds, it was a cow shed, and an owl woke me up screaming. And so I figured I better go out. And so I walked out into the field and then there were these three very heavy flashes of light could, you know, coming across, this was at four o'clock in the morning. And then later the following morning, about an, uh, a mile away was this massive crop formation in a, a perfect uh, form in terms of a, a Trinitarian form. But so it's like, what were these fairies? I mean, these are plasma fairies. One can get into the scientific aspect. We went in and we saw how the, the plants had been bent, and but we have physical evidence of it. But on the same hand, it, it was just a, you know, a very impactful, flow of light yeah and, and so I, I i keep it in that paradox i just i you know whether it's i mean it's for real but it's not for i mean it's so thank you very much and your uh demonic realities i think will help clarify because this whole issue now of what's coming in terms of the disclosure movement you know it's are they ufos or yes. are they uaps or are they balls of light or are they orbs or and then the whole realm of non-human or other than human intelligence what is this more than i call it cia conscious intelligent awareness it's different than american cia but it's a conscious right, intelligence right, right, right. awareness but it's but thank you very much and i look forward to reading your book no interesting experience paul i have a chapter on crop circles actually uh, okay. because uh, you know that they're now widely held to be uh, man-made you know that they've they've been officially debunked 
And I'm one of the few people who's not quite so sure about that. I know? totally agree with you. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've, yeah, they are not. There are some that are, but there are some in the United States here that we've had that there's no way. And the most recent one, there's no way a human could have done it. Well, certainly there, are, there are, I've come across some which which defy reason, really, because they're yeah. fantastically complicated uh, and huge. And with, you know, they're like sort of, um, you know, fractals and so on. And, yeah. and yet mm -hmm. they, they appear to they appear to have be, been a may been made in the very short hours of darkness in the in the British summer uh, next to busy roads, you know. Yeah. And so I, I question some of them, you know, I think some of them might well be might well be uh, supernatural or possibly the work of the fairies. Who knows? But, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I also was a, I was also one of the officials at the official uh, prop, work, prop circle uh, manufacturing competition. Oh, by Rupert Rupert Sheldrake, Sheldrake organized. Yeah. He said, let's mm -hmm. let's be scientific. Let's see if people can make them. Mm -hmm. And teams of crop circle makers, we we got a field and they made these crop circles. And I have to say, they were pretty crap on the whole. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they really yeah. weren't that good. <laughs> well, there were some beautiful ones in France just uh, last week, and so the season has begun. And uh, I I leave it as a paradox. Some yeah. of them are probably I, human, I and some of them, right. yeah. So, but thank you much, greatly. Thank you much, Alex. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Veronica, please join us. Thank you to both of us. And my question actually is to uh, either one of you. And you sort of answered it in part when um, you explained the daemons. But would you consider a conspiracy theory a misuse of the imagination? or uh, a misunderstanding about the daemon or, and I wonder if we call conspiracy theories, conspiracy stories, because stories are so important to human beings because yeah. the fears have to be expressed somehow or, or the questions have to be shared somehow. And, and, and it's through those stories. So what do you think about this, this plague that we're going through now with these conspiracies that are, I'm not talking about those who create them because obviously they have agendas. I'm talking about the people who believe in them or which can happen to any one of us, basically. We're vulnerable yeah. and, and we love stories. So, so, and, sometimes, and sometimes they're true. Yes. I mean, not all conspiracy theories are, are untrue. Um, that's to say there are conspiracies. Um, my feeling about conspiracy theories is that they are, that they, rep they represent um, the imagination's desire always to proliferate, um, that it can't be contained in, in single theories, hypotheses and so on, that we love to confabulate and so on. But it's also, they also stem from a true in, in, intuition, which is that there is some greater truth behind appearances. Mm -hmm. That appearances don't give us the whole of reality. That there is always another dimension of depth behind those those stories. So I think the the sort of impulse behind the conspiracy theory is a is a true one, but mm -hmm. it's distorted into a into a, a, a an alternative and literal hypothesis. You know. Which is often okay. ludicrous. Do you see what I mean? So oh, I think, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think it's sort of it, it, that conspiracy theories have the same relationship to imagination as fantasy does. But, but fantasy and imagination right. are connected. But a fantasy is is sort of untrue, because it's constructed by our our just our wish fulfillment it's it's it, it's self-serving it serves the desires of the ego um mm. and whereas the imagination does not it, if anything the imagination is destructive towards the ego you know mm. that, that that it is a much larger kind of framework in in which to construct things and so uh that's my feeling about conspiracy theories you know that 
that I don't subscribe to any particularly. Um, Thank you I, so much. I, that was I, very helpful. To, yeah. to, to Patrick's anthropological and epistemic comments, which I subscribe, I would add two more, a linguistic and a political one. So the linguistic is conspiracy theories are not theories. They're not theories, actually. And, and well, and to conspire is to breathe together. So it's not a big deal. It's like they're not even theories. And it's it means like some people breathe together because that's what they think together. To me, the most important one is the political aspect of conspiracy theories and conspiracy theories. And that, that will sound like a conspiracy theory, but I think it's actually the case were invented so that we could call conspiracy theories certain things so that we would not entertain them. So I'm, I'm very wary of this use of language in a political sense. And I, I, every time I can, I'm very critical of, of the use of prefixes such as pseudoscience and so on. And I think conspiracy theories have the same ill post function from the other side, which is, oh, we'll call it conspiracy theory. And then of course, if you touch it, you'll you'll contaminate yourself with it. So, mm. so we rather let it there and, and suppress it and let it die. But but no, um, I think there are kernels of truth. And even if there aren't many, to call them conspiracy theories, it's it's both disingenuous and, and I think unfair because that's not usually what, what I see they are. They may be misleading and, and even totally wrong. I would just stop using the word conspiracy theory, but it's so convenient to call it a conspiracy theory because then you won't touch it because you are the same person that doesn't believe in them. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. An interesting example of a, of a conspiracy theory is the idea that um, in the UFO world, you know, that the, the government has has made contact with alien beings and indeed has has their spacecraft stashed in you know remote parts of the nevada desert and so on um the idea that that, that the that the deep state is somehow colluding with aliens um and reproducing their technology is is just a very old is a literalization of the old myth that the fairies or the diamonds bring us wisdom you know um that that contact with the other world contains a treasure and that treasure is wisdom that we bring back and so on and this has been literalized into not so much wisdom as an advanced technology you know um so i can see i can see how they how they mesh together these things and and once again literalizing is is a key factor in it mm. thank you carol would you like to come on with your question Thank you, Eleanor. Um, so, hi, I'm actually addressing both Patrick and Alex. I'd love feedback from both of you. I'm actually writing my dissertation currently. Um, I'm a PhD student at the California Institute, of, well, PhD candidate at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And my dissertation topic is universal consciousness and the vacuum field as an interconnected reality an integral approach to reality and knowledge. And Patrick, first, I just want to say thank you so much for referring to the universe as metaphorical. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's That relates to something that came to me. And second, I want to thank you for taking it to the, discussing the quantum level and how that relates to the daimones or however we pronounce that correctly. Um, Alex, I just want to say, I want to bring you in because my second dissertation committee member actually suggested I ask you to be on my third external member, but I read one of your brilliant articles on consciousness and I was like, I'm not sure I understand him. The second time I read it, I got it better, but I would love both of your feedback. And Alex, I'm hoping that we can have a conversation one day. I would really appreciate it. But what I'd like Patrick and Alex, your feedback on are two things. First, um, Patrick, especially for you, um, the what I call the higher beings, the higher ups have told me that I'm an oracle. And when they told me that, I said, well, if I'm an oracle, who am I channeling? And it was like wah, 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 wah. Um, a little sound going on, like rustling, talking. Um, and then they answered a consortium of angels. So I don't know where that fits into your 
um, scheme of diamonds, but um, I also work with archangels when I do healing work. So that's one thing I'd love to hear you talk about, Patrick. The other thing is um, I'd love to, if I may share briefly, one thing that channeled through me when I was writing my proposal, which is still in my dissertation, and this relates to understanding reality in a metaphorical sense or the universe in a metaphorical sense. And what I heard, I'm going to do my best to remember it, what I heard the higher ups telling me is that quantum reality, what we call quantum reality, is an energized metaphorical expression of ideas in the mind of God and the concrete classical level of, of reality of objects is a concrete, concretized, objectivized expression of the metaphorical quantum level of reality. And it went on from there. But basically what I realized the universe was giving me was a quantum version of Plato's cave allegory. And so I'd, if I need to explain more, I will, but I would love your feedback. So the quantum, I don't, as a, as a, a, a woman intending to start doing philosophy from the perspective of a grandmother and Patrick, I was thinking you do a lot of philosophy. You sound like a grandfather doing philosophy. <laughs> At least you bring in the wisdom oh. um, and I love it. Um, I, I would love to say that it's also at the quantum level, it's um, metaphorical expression, energized expression of um, energies in the womb of the divine. So I welcome your feedback, please, both of you. Um, that's all a bit above my pay grade, Carol. <laughs> um, as for angels, I'm happy with them, you know, um, but the trouble with, the, the trouble with any worldview that is too spiritual, which um, subscribes to angels, and I'm very happy with angelic beings, but a lot of people find that um, the angels can begin by telling you the truth, um, and then they'll um, tell you something untrue as well, that they are they are themselves tricky, and it's because you know, they are daimonic in, in origin, and they are in some sense... Um, um one half of the daimonic realm the spiritual half which has a lot of wisdom and truth but they could also deceive you and this is what spiritualists and channelers often find you know they're they're famously they're they're often given all sorts of knowledge that they couldn't indeed knowledge about the channeler personally that, that they couldn't possibly have known and then they tell you that the world's going to end and you go and sat, sit on the mountain and it doesn't end. And, you know, it's kind of a cosmic joke, you know, and that reveals that they that they have a daimonic side to them, that they are can be tricksy. So you have to watch out for that, not take them too much as gospel. Um, as for the correlation between um, quantum mechanics, consciousness, and so on. I'll leave that to Alex. He's the expert there. Well, I'm not, not an expert, but I'll offer three quick paths because I am I also love going back to quantum mechanics, but sometimes I don't. So there are three things you could do. We could discuss them offline because <clears throat> we could ignore quantum mechanics altogether. Why, why, why would we need it? I mean, some of those things, I sometimes imagine we could be talking about them 140 years ago and just just make progress without needing to talk about it. The second exercise would be to bring quantum mechanics as some sort of um, backup or inspiration, or just to know that that thing has happened. And and it's perhaps, as, as Patrick was alluding to, a deluxe opportunity in which the, the diamonds just express fully with all it, their force in, in something properly scientific. Right, but just know, okay, we can use the analogy like this has been shown in the in in the realm of really small energies, and and so now, as someone used this metaphor, now the traffic light is not red anymore to entertain this in the macroscopic world, but it's maybe orange or even green. And then the third route is like the hardcore route route, which would would be learn the math, 
and understand really what those equations mean. And only at the end of this process, just come back to the metaphor, the interpretation, the philosophy. So these are three possible routes. And I think they're all legitimate and valid. So it, it would be more a question of knowing what it is that you want to do. Because I must admit, as a, as, a, as a physicist, sometimes I feel uncomfortable when we need to invoke so much the quantum stuff um, for, for spirituality. But at the same time, I see people doing it in proper ways. Like next month, for instance, in this very series, we'll have Federico Fagin. And he will speak about consciousness and about quantum physics in, in a very literal, if you wish, mathematical sense. So it can also be done, but we don't need to do it in this way. So we can be more, let's relax ourselves about the quantum stuff. We don't need to bring it in every time, but if we do, we have different options as, as how to do it. That's what I would say briefly now. Thank you both. Um, Alex, just so you know, I have a son who has a PhD in particle physics, physics so he keeps me in line um, <laughs> when he can. Um, and Patrick, um, ironically, given what you said, ironically, the archangels I work with in order to do healing let me know if I say something that's not on, you know, perfectly in alignment with a higher truth. So they actually oh, hold good. me accountable for being truthful myself. Um, and the Archangel um, Raphael is the Archangel of healing science and truth. In other words, in order for healing to occur, we have to be living true to, I would say, love. To make keep you. it simple. Thank you both. Thank you. Carol. Thank you. We have time for just one more question. Uh, Eva, I invite you to come in and join us. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so appreciative to be here. I have been reading and following your work and it's so resonant. Um, oh, am I muted? No. Uh, no. Okay. I have a little sign up that says uh, unmute myself. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex, for being open to bringing in the magic, first of all, um, and this whole other realm. I am a student of uh, Kabbalah and uh, Hermeticism and alchemy, and it's where my research is and my writing and, um, and, I'm, and it's this other realm. So the daimonic realm is very, very close for me. And Patrick, I'm just so honored to be here and to thank you for all your work. Because uh, um, even last night, I was I look, going through your Mercurius book as I'm preparing some research for a talk I'm doing on alchemy, gnosis, and um, the subtle body. And so uh, this is so timely. So uh, it's coming from the imaginal realm for me is real. Um, everything, creativity stems from that. And I've been really struggling with working, and this is partially for you, Alex, with working with the um, with the tree of life, with the Kabbalistic tree of life as a map for that would really also integrate uh, uh, quantum physics, because I think there is an overlap there. But that's been my research. I've been looking high and low for how to bring those together. Um, but my own work is uh, very much hermetic and understanding, uh, of course, the duplex God that um, you're speaking of uh, so much, the duplex God that brings us together to the alchemical wedding of marrying Logos and Eros ultimately. So um, I don't know what else to say because there's so much here to say, but just to say thank you. No, thank you, Eva. That was very interesting. Good luck with your research. Thank you. <laughs> Especially Kabbalah, which I'm lamentably ignorant about. But the more I read, you know, whenever I dip into the Kabbalah and, and Gershom Sholem, I'm always amazed at how resonant and important it is. It's it's most wonderful system. And um, if I weren't so lazy, I'd go into it more deeply. It's it's a it, it's a it's a wonderful map, and I think it's much more ancient than we than we realized. Um, yes, yes. As a map for cosmos, psyche, and matter, which has been, yeah. So to be continued. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Alex. Do you have any closing remarks? Well, Patrick, we need you. We need you. <laughs> even even if we even if some of us didn't know it. The Christians need you, the scientists need you, the Buddhists need you, 
I think we all need you because these these isms I was talking at the beginning are so pervasive. I'm not sure we can make it, but definitely we need to keep on trying. And and my discovery of your work has been very transformative and, and it's ongoing. So thank you very much. Oh, well, I'm delighted, Alex. You're, you're most welcome. Yeah. Well, thank you both for being here today. Thank you for taking the time, Patrick, um, to share this with our community. And pleasure, thank you everybody pleasure. for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure. And we look forward to seeing you here again at the Pari Center. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.